Bloomberg is now on your dashboard. With Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, it gives you access to every Bloomberg podcast, live audio feeds from Bloomberg Radio, print stories from Bloomberg News in audio form, and the latest headlines at the click of a button with Bloomberg News Now. It's free with the latest version of the Bloomberg Business app. That's the Bloomberg Business app. Get it on your phone in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. Just download the app, connect your phone to your car, and get started. And it's all presented by our sponsor, Interactive Brokers. Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. I think we need to go over to the Red Sea, get the latest reporting on tensions in the Red Sea and its impact on global oil. Brendan Murray joins us here, uh, Bloomberg News reporter out of London. Uh, Brendan, I'm seeing a, a article on the Bloomberg Journal, Bloomberg News. How about Lloyd, a big, big global shipper? They're continuing to reroute their ships uh, uh, away from the Red Sea. What's the latest? Right. Well, it, there still seems to be uh, the risk of attacks in, uh, sailing through the Red Sea. The latest was an MSC uh, ship that, that was attacked yesterday. Uh, so Hapag Lloyd is, is taking, the, taking the stance that we're still going to divert around Africa these, uh, the, and not take the shortcut through the Suez Canal, uh, seeing too much risk of doing so. These ships are carrying anywhere from a half a billion dollars to a couple wow. billion dollars in cargo, uh, not to mention the, you know, the serious risks to their crews. So uh, many of these big uh, shipping companies are saying it's still too risky uh, to take the chance. So they're, they're making that extra a 25% uh, a, a journey that's 25% longer mm. than, uh, than it otherwise would be. Uh, they're, they're still continuing to make that decision, and the number of ships that are diverting is still rising. Well, and Brendan, this is despite the U.S.'s efforts through a maritime task force to make sure that merchant vessels are, are protected, that any drones potentially shot down by or sent by the Houthis would be shot down. So is anyone feeling protected enough to go through the Red Sea right now? Is there any real activity? Well, we, heard, we had a statement also from Maersk, which is the number two global uh, container shipping line, that said they're preparing uh, to, to resume uh, sailing across the Red Sea as soon as it's uh, appropriate. Uh, now, when that is, we don't know. But at least they're, they're, they're sounding like they're, they're willing to, to, uh, to, to, take that, to take that trip. Uh, as soon as they can get assurances that that the, that their ships will be secure, uh, that was a turnaround from from a week ago when they said uh, they were calling on uh, the U.S. and the U.K. and other other countries to uh, to provide more protection. So we're seeing a sort of incremental steps back toward the direction of sailing through the Suez again, but still not it's not happening on any on any large scale. I see, uh, Brendan, from some uh, Bloomberg Intelligence research that spot rates for container shipping have jumped 26% over the past few weeks. Who pays that higher cost? Well, the, the cargo owners pay that cost. They, 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 these get added on and surcharges and other, other sort of incremental uh, uh, costs that the, that the shipping lines uh, charge them. Ultimately, uh, the, the, the customers uh, of, of uh, transport services pay those, and they in turn pass those to consumers in one way or the other eventually. So 26% increase is, is not an enormous spike higher when you look at shipping rates have, have plunged 75% this year, but it's still a, a turnaround from, from the steady erosion of, of freight rates that we've seen throughout the year, and one that the shipping companies frankly would welcome. They, they can't really make money uh, at, at rates the way they were three weeks ago, but now they're kind of back in the back in the uh, in the profit making zone. So, Brendan, obviously, there's a, a cost calculation here in terms of what the impact of of this waterway, which is so crucial in terms of maritime trade being blocked is. But it also, to your point you were making earlier about the time it takes to go around the coast of Africa instead is about time, especially when we think about how supply chains were so snarled back uh, during the heart of COVID days. Are we going to see any of that backups in ports as all of these ships are taking longer to arrive at their destinations? Or is it likely to be a bit smoother than we experienced a few years ago? 
Well, it all depends on how long this lasts. I mean, we're, we're seeing hundreds and hundreds of ships diverting now. Those are all going to be late in their ports of de original ports of destination. All that cargo is going to have to be rerouted. Uh, with new, new schedules for, for delivery and pickup uh, with trucks and trains. And, and the, so we'll see an initial jolt to supply chains. But uh, in truth, supply chains have been pretty resilient uh, they've, and, and absorbed a lot of these, even the biggest shocks. Uh, so we'll, we'll see some initial initial disruptions uh, in, in the coming weeks, uh, and if it gets resolved and, and shipping continues through the Suez Canal, the, 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 the likelihood is this won't leave a huge, uh, a huge dent on the, on the global economy or global trade more broadly. Uh, but initially, it's going to be painful, especially uh, come January when uh, one of the peak shipping seasons mm. of the year happens uh, as retailers look to restock after the holidays. Brendan, ultimately, who decides when it is safe to transit the Red Sea? Is it the U.S. Navy? Is it the shipping companies themselves? Who decides? Well, it's, it sounds like the, the shipping companies themselves are making this decision based, uh, based in large part on uh, the signals they're getting from the, the, the forces in the area. Uh, it's, there are a few sh uh, container ships going through. Uh, uh, and, you know, as we saw yesterday with the MSC ship, that you know, they're, they're getting attacked by drones and rockets and other things. Uh, so the shipping companies, though, are taking their cue from the, their insurance companies that are saying, uh -huh. look, it's, 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 too, it's too costly for us. To, uh, it's going to be too... You're, we're going to raise your premium if you want to do that. So it's a, there's a trade-off uh, that, that they're weighing, and ultimately, uh, you know, higher, higher insurance costs uh, will, will sort of dictate some of those decisions. All right, Brendan Murray, thanks so much for joining us from London. He is our trade czar here yeah. at Bloomberg. I love the czar <laughs> titles, Paul. Yeah, those too. are the best titles in the building. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Another good title, though, is executive editor. And I'm pleased to say our senior executive editor for Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy, is joining us now, also from London, to talk through how this is translating into oil markets. It's actually interesting, Will. You had oil closing at the highest level in about a month yesterday. Coming off those levels a touch today, we're now at $80.65 for a barrel of Brent crude. Should we be expecting this to resonate more with the oil market or are traders just expecting that this is going to be a very short term impact that ultimately doesn't fundamentally change anything that much? Good morning, Katie. I, I think it has had an impact, to be honest. Oil prices are higher than where they were. Uh, they've fallen really quite sharply early in December and, they, and they've rallied uh, against this uh, news in the Red Sea. Um, they're still below where they were uh, at the beginning of the fall. Uh, when they were close to $100, but they, they have rallied. I think it does make people nervous. It makes people nervous that the conflicts that we're seeing in the Middle East could uh, spread. Clearly, the Houthi rebels who are uh, responsible for this attack are sponsored by Iran, uh, as is Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So that wider regional tension uh, remains, and, and it does make oil traders uh, nervous. But I think there are a couple of reasons why the reaction perhaps hasn't been stronger. Uh, oil markets remain fairly well supplied globally, uh, and uh, a lot of the oil uh, coming through the Red Sea uh, is uh, destined for uh, it's Russian oil destined for Asia, and it's unlikely that Russian oil perhaps would be a, a target of uh, these attacks. So there are reasons why they, the, the people aren't so nervous about oil tankers in the Red Sea, and, and finally. Saudi Arabia and its allies in OPEC, especially like their railroads, retain a good amount of spare capacity, uh, which means that if the situation were to worsen, that there are policy responses that OPEC could make. And I think that means that some of the sting of geopolitics on oil prices is, is removed at the moment. Will, before this uh, latest flare-up in the Red Sea, oil prices had been trading lower and WTI crude oil was below 70. Um, where where is the market now in terms of assessing demand here? Um, it appears that the U.S. economy uh, at least may be in for a soft landing. Where's the sense of demand over the next three to six to 12 months? Yeah, look, I think we should start that conversation, Paul, by talking about demand this year, which has been a lot stronger than many people expected. It rebounded incredibly sharply in China, as China was the last major economy to come out of uh, COVID. Uh, it's been very healthy in the United States, as you say. The the economy continues to do well and people continue to, to drive and they continue to demand 
goods that are transported by truck. Um, I think that demand has been much stronger than many people expected. And if the economy does have that soft landing, there's every reason to expect that demand will continue to be fairly strong. It might not be as strong as it has been this year, because I think that coming out of COVID in China effect was particularly strong. We had that really big snapback. But, you know, we may add more than a million barrels a year a day next year. Uh, that's the sort of forecast that people are looking at. And that's a fairly healthy increase in demand by historical standards. Um, so the question then becomes, what happens with supply? And is, is it more than matched with supply and, and that balance? But I think you're right to point out, Paul, that as people think about the market next year, that strength in demand is one of the key questions that they're, they're thinking about. But to your point, Will, about supply, we've obviously learned within the last several weeks that shale this year in the U.S. far exceeded expectations in terms of what uh, they were able to produce in 2023. It's OPEC really that has been more restrictive. The Saudis really the ones leading that as they would like to keep prices elevated. If indeed that demand picture you're painting does come true in 2024 and you see an uptick in demand, should we expect that OPEC is necessarily going to respond by putting more out there on the market? Are they likely to try to keep things as tight as possible? So they agreed to they agreed to cut more in a, a recent meeting in the beginning of December. Uh, the Saudis themselves were not contributing to that, but other members agreed to pair back production or forego increases that they had already agreed in the case of the United Arab Emirates. I think what that means is that OPEC will want to say that see that play out in the first quarter. Uh, when we last spoke to the Saudi energy minister, he said, they were willing to keep those curves in place beyond the first quarter to see uh, demand tighten. So I think when you put that together, they're unlikely to put any more oil in the market in the short term. Um, they really would like to see these cuts work and they would like to see the market tighten. Um, so they will, they will be patient and wait for that to happen before they, before they think about putting many more oil back into the market. Despite some of the at least warmer temperatures here in the U.S., we are in peak heating season here. Will, give us a sense of how things are in Europe. Uh, turned out better than expected last winter. What's the situation for this winter? Yeah, we haven't, we've had a bit of cold uh, winter. I mean, here in the U.K., it's been an incredibly warm, wet and windy uh, winter. And that kind of weather means that uh, energy supplies are fairly ample for two reasons. One, uh, it doesn't put a huge strain on gas demand because people aren't needing it to heat their homes. Uh, or heating oil demand, and two, all this wind means that we're generating a huge amount of power <laughs> through wind. Um, through the, you know, I think I looked this morning, and the UK was producing more than sixty percent of its power demand through uh, wind turbines. Wow. So you put that together, and it means that if that weather continues, uh, we should come through this winter in fairly good shape. And in fact, people are fairly confident this winter won't be too bad. There are, there are above average levels of gas supply. And as we say, we haven't had a big cold snap yet. But that could, of course, change wherever it is in the Arab All right. Will Kennedy, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Will Kennedy, uh, Senior Managing Editor over there in London, covering all things on the energy front. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Really, there is still so much geopolitics at play, yep, trade to be digesting all of it, and its impact on the markets. Paul. Yeah, we are seeing yields move, though. We've got the 10-year Treasury uh, off about eight basis points, 3.81%. Uh, and boy, it wasn't that long ago we had the 10-year was trading north of 5% there. So big, big move in rates. We're seeing mortgage rates come down. Yeah. That was important for Kaylee Lyons as she's house hunting, and she liked <laughs> to see those uh, rates come down uh, even more. Let's get a sense of maybe uh, where these markets are going because it's been such a move just over the last seven, eight, nine weeks here. Big, big moves up in the equity markets, big moves down in yields. I'm not sure uh, how many people kind of saw that on their bingo card. But Nancy Tangler joins us. She's the CIO of Laffer Tangler Investments, joining us uh, via Zoom here. Nancy, boy, this move we've had over the last eight, nine weeks has really been something to marvel at. What do you make of it? Well, <laughs> I love the bingo card analogy. Yeah. Um, 
never never had much luck with that myself. But yeah, I, I think uh, a couple of things, Paul. We wrote a piece on October 31st that said opportunity in every difficulty. And at the beginning of last year, we wrote a piece that um, said, or of this year, that we thought investors were being way too pessimistic uh, and that we expected to see the markets do much better than most thought. I, we don't do market forecasts for the year end, but we did say in the October 31 piece, we thought we'd see a rally and not... Uh, expecting this much of a rally to be sure. I think you've got a lot of things going on. It's not just the Fed. It's, you know, the money on the sidelines. It's creeping in. It's window dressing. But I do think that stocks, um, if you look at the multiple, you're at 15 times, 15.3 times S&P X FANG. With FANG, you're at 17 times next year's earnings. That That is not super lofty. And I think we have the opportunity to move up from here with some choppiness in the first quarter. I always love, Nancy, your notes in particular. And I think back to sort of the October 31st note, I think back to some of the quotes you use of Winston Churchill in particular. You say, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So be the optimist, and I know you are one. What are some of the difficulties that you're going to be keeping a keen eye on as you try and assert some of the optimism? Well, I love your Winston Churchill, Caroline. So (laughs) I quote him at every opportunity. Um, yeah, so I think one of the biggest concerns is is inflation licked. Now, we know that the core number, uh, uh, the PCE number has been coming down, but the sticky inflation number uh, per the Atlanta Fed is still very high. And if you look at historical numbers back in the in the 70s and uh, period where we had inflation restart, they, it's pretty positively correlated. Now, we're at the turning point, so whether or not that happens uh, remains to be seen. But... I think the other thing I'm quite concerned about is the Red Sea. And uh, if you look at the good news in the PMIs, it's that delivery times have come down, but they're about to go up if we have to continue to go uh, in alternate routes uh, for shipping. So that's something on our radar. Uh, We're also, we're not concerned about earnings. We think margins are going to continue to improve. That was the good news story uh, in the second half of this year. And so we, we think that continues. Managements have done an excellent job because most of them refinance before uh, rates went up. But, you know, I haven't been particularly complimentary of the Fed and they can still screw (laughs) this up, in my view. We are going to go into Red Sea in a moment, but I want to go back to some of the expertise that I'm so pleased you bring to our technology shows on the odd occasion that we're lucky enough to welcome you on. Nancy, you are someone who you might not think that the Fed's always doing that great, but you are pretty focused on certain leadership and you've called out certain tech companies that have done particularly well in this environment. What of breadth in technology? You've been trying to say, look, it's not just all about these seven killer stocks. There are others to be had. Do you still believe in that area being able to lead us higher for 2024? I do, Caroline. The total addressable market for generative AI, cloud, uh, digital transition is enormous. It's in the trillions of dollars. And so the question becomes who are going to be the lead or who are going to be the survivors and the thrivers in this environment. We still think you want to own a couple of the FANG names, but there are much broader places to be focused on. Uh, some old economy tech like Oracle, I don't know, I call Broadcom the poor man's NVIDIA. <laughs> um, that 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 is one place that we think still has plenty of room to run. Uh, we've started looking at a few new names, which I can't talk about because we're in the process of buying them, but I can sh- shortly talk about them. Uh, and, and I think you want to remain overweight this group, but we are ov- also overweight industrials. Mm. And our big move at the end in the fall of 2022 was to add to consumer discretionary and tech. And those two have been two of the three best performing sectors this year. I think there's still opportunities in consumer discretionary as well. Well, that's kind of where I wanted to go, Nancy, because it may surprise you to find out that I am not long that magnificent stocks, uh, seven stocks and 2023. So what do I do in 24? Do I try to chase those names at big tech growth or do I, I don't know, try to find some value somewhere else? Well, Paul, you know what's so interesting is that if you look at the valuations compared to the 90s, and I think when I was on with you last, Caroline, I talked about uh, the, the that this market is an analog, uh, or the 90s is an analog to this market, a lot of similarities in terms of inflation, high rates, an inverted yield curve, a soft landing, a war. Um, and those valuations, I mean, all you have to do is look at Microsoft. It was trading at the end of the 90s 
at 50 plus times uh, peak earnings, and it's currently at somewhere between 28 and 30 times forward earnings. These are not peak earnings for the company. So I think there are, are spots. Like I, I'm less enamored, though I know people love Meta. It's not one of our top picks, but would I continue to add to, to Microsoft here? Or uh, Amazon is a name that we think is probably our top pick in that space for next year. Yeah, I think you use weakness and you just be disciplined. You don't chase any of them. The last thing I'll say is if you look at NVIDIA on a on a forward multiple basis, it's, it's pretty cheap compared to what you might Whoa. think since the stock has doubled. It's in the, you know, the mid 25 range. So uh, I think those are all names that you can use as opportunistically to, to round out holdings. Don't chase anything because the market will pull back, will get a correction. And that's when you step in and buy with you know, both hands. I wonder if a correction, Nancy, to the extent we want to buy with both hands at some point this year, will it be earnings based? I mean, you look at the S&P 500 earnings expectations are up about 12 to 13 percent for 2024. It feels a little frothy to me. Do you think there's material earnings risk in this market? Well, um, what I, <laughs> well, I think the dollar's coming down, so that will help some of the multinationals. I think it will continue. I mean, it has come down. It will continue to come down. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure about that because if you look at the companies um, that that we're, we've just been talking about, they have not only been guiding up, but they've been expanding margins. I mean, there will be companies that miss earnings and they will be punished. Uh, Oracle just missed uh, guidance. And so it was punished. And we use that as an opportunity to add to holdings because we think long term, these are the companies that you want to own in a slowing growth environment and a tight labor market where technology spend is how companies get productivity. So I think we may be surprised. But remember, and you know this as well as I do, analysts are wrong to the tune of about <laughs> two thirds of the time each quarter. <laughs> um, so we know to the upside and the downside. So I think what you have to just be ready to do is you have your list. And if they do disappoint, you step in and you add to those names. Nancy Tangler, it is always such a joy to have you on the show with us, CIO of Laffer Tangler Investments, wishing you a wonderful new year. And I'm sure we'll be having you across our network soon in January. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Boy, we were just talking about the value of sports, and it's just some red headline across the Bloomberg terminal. NBA approves Dallas Mavericks sale to Miriam Adelson, uh, that is the from the gaming Adelson family uh, in Vegas. So again, a big news, big dollars, um, and that's kind of what we're seeing uh, in sports, no doubt about it. Let's bring in uh, someone I've known for a long time and one of the smartest voices in the global media space, uh, Ian Whitaker, a managing director and owner at Liberty Sky Advisors. Uh, he's based in London. So, Ian, let's start with kind of the number one issue, I think, for most investors that look at global media. It's like, what's the new world order? It's streaming, I guess. But who are the companies that can survive this? How do you think this is going to play out uh, in 2024? Yeah, well, thanks very much uh, for, for the very kind words. Um, I mean, I think you have to go back to the fundamentals here. If you look, who's going to be the ultimate winners of this game? I think it is going to be the tech companies simply because they have the deep pockets that the other players do not. I think what you're going to find is that some of the players like a Disney, a Comcast, probably also a Warner, will, will have to now stay in the streaming market because essentially those companies, what they made was a big, big strategic mistake several years ago, which was really to go in all in on streaming. And I think you know, the, the consequences of that are still rippling through the market. I think there will have to be consolidation that will eventually come through. I think Warner Paramount deal possibly gets done within the next 12 months, so I'd be slightly longer with that. But I would say in terms of who, got to, who has the deep pockets, it's really the Apples, the Amazons, uh, and so forth. One thing I would say, and I think this is important because you know, all these streaming companies, and I think it's one of the other big mistakes they also made as well. They looked at the world from a very US-centric point of view. And they thought that essentially, you know, the dynamics of what would work in the US would work globally. And therefore, it made sense to go after you yeah. know, big subscriber numbers globally. It doesn't. Europe has structurally lower penetration, structurally lower ARPU than the US market. And if you look what's happened with the Premier League rights, for example, sort of, of you know, we're talking there about the NBA rights and what's happening. 
none of the tech companies actually sort of bid aggressively for the Premier League rights in the UK. The dynamics, the economics of it just don't work. So I think what we're going to see here is increasingly with streaming that effectively there's going to be you know, the realisation that different models work in, in different geographical markets. So, Ian, you know, I've pitched every tech company, basically every media company that's out there for 25 years and gotten no bites whatsoever, really. I, you know, I'm wondering if they can just stay on the sidelines and let some of these media companies just beat each other over the head and then pick up the content on the cheap. I'm just not sure the appetite for Silicon Valley to come into Hollywood. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a very good point. If you look at when, if you look at the, the various maneuvers that have gone on, Apple essentially, you know, yes, it's got into films, so it's been very selective. Amazon bought MGM, but it hasn't been a major push that has come through. I think an interesting one would be what Netflix would do. I mean, for me, sort of Netflix joining the Paramount acquisition talks would make sense for Netflix. There's a number of sort of, of areas that a tie in there would actually help out on things. The analogy I've used in the past, and I've been using this for several years now, is that what you've got in streaming is, if you want a historical analogy, it's, it's sort of akin to World War I. But what you've got is that you've got the major media companies, as you say, essentially bashing each other over the heads, really exhausting themselves into you know, a state where, quite frankly, it's very, very hard to actually make major gains and yeah. actually sort of oh, wink and, uh, convincingly. And then if you look at actually what happened in World War I, you know, the Americans came in and effectively sort of oh, won being by the last players in the game. And that's essentially where we are with the tech companies now that the Apples, the Amazons, the, the Googles and so forth, particularly in the US market when it comes to sports, yeah, they really now sort of let everyone else exhaust themselves and can now just march in and, and really take up the spoils. So I think particularly in the US, I would say the tech companies you would say would be the ultimate winners. I think when it's uh, globally, I think the picture is a lot more, it, it's a lot more varied. Europe, for example, I think the, the free-to-air broadcasters there, yeah, there are different viewing habits. There's different ways of paying for pay TV and so forth. But I think most of the major established media companies really made a massive strategic error. And it's something I've been saying for several years in going full on into the streaming model, which quite frankly, destroyed a lot of the infrastructure that had worked so well for several decades. OK, so playing devil's advocate, you sit down with a CEO of the legacy media companies. Many of them would say, look, from a standing start, I've now built a business that's several billions. Yes, you might not say streaming is working, but I've managed to make it a significant revenue driver. What would you say to that? Well, it may be a significant revenue driver, but from an analyst, you know, from an analytical standpoint, financial market standpoint, what people care about are profits. Yeah. And you look at on a quarterly basis, you've got Warner, which is, has made a slight profit. Netflix, as you say, is the only one that so far has managed to make yeah, a consistent operating profit moving forward and so on. But its free cash flow isn't particularly sort of, I mean, it's okay. But when you look against its uh, peers, definitely not huge and so forth. I think you've got sort of, you've got several ways you can approach this. You, you can say, look, we made a fundamental strategic error here in really going full on into streaming. We now actually have the courage to step back and say, you know what? Maybe, maybe we actually need to exit this game. For me, the smartest player when it came, the smartest media company, when it came to what happened with streaming was Sony. Yeah. And Sony decided we're not getting involved. We're just going to license our content to everyone else. And effectively, they were the arms dealer. It's Ian, to yeah, else. to use that analogy, though, I've heard that a lot of late. Be an arms dealer, be an arms dealer. Mm -hmm. A lot of these companies don't want to be arms dealer. They don't think that it's lucrative enough. They don't want to just be supplying content. Why would they not want that? Well, I think a lot of it is essentially they, they've been invested in the streaming pattern. They've got to say they've gone down for several years now down this route. As you say, they've built an infrastructure. They, in many cases, they realign their companies really to focus on primarily on the streaming operations and so forth. It's a very, very hard job for companies to step back and say, you know what, maybe we made a mistake here. Maybe we need to realign again. Shareholders don't like it. Investors don't like it. Mm. You know, simply because it raises questions about the quality of the management uh, and the decisions they've taken as well. I think you know, one way to look at this is to say, you know, flip it round. What exactly is going to change with the streaming model that will suddenly make it a yeah. hugely more profitable model? Challenge and the question is, when you look at things at the moment, you can't really look at anything that will say there's a real game changer here. 
All right, well, here's a real game changer. Bloomberg Intelligence is out with some research saying with around $6 billion in estimated 2024 losses, Apple TV Plus will lose 80% more on its streaming business than Disney, Paramount, NBC, and Warner Brothers Discovery combined. So you talk about an entity that can spend like crazy and just let everybody else kind of fall by the wayside. So Ian, I got to ask you, when you talk to institutional investors, why is anybody buying any of these big media names? I just don't get it. Well, I think what you've got, (laughs) I mean, it's a very good question. I think there are several elements here. If you look particularly at the US media companies, they do have other assets that are performing well. Disney, for example, theme parks, you know, theme parks across the sector have done very well. They do have very, very good historical content assets. And this is to go back to the point before about being the arms dealer. You know, what you've got here, if you look, for example, in terms of streaming, it's always the old shows that seem to perform the best. You know, the <laughs> new shows effectively are, are you know, they, they come out, they get lauded, and then they get forgotten often within six to nine months. We're all back to I listening to you... Suits again on a different <laughs> type yeah. of device. <laughs> exactly. And that, that's the whole point. And I think for, for what you've got for many of these play, for many investors here, is what they're thinking is at some point, it will all come out right. And the problem becomes with that is that it doesn't come out right automatically. You've got to take the companies and the managements and they've actually got to take active measures to make sure that they go down in the right route. And I look at all the, certainly I'd look at the legacy media companies and I look at what they're doing at the moment. I think, you know, what a discovery. I think, you know, they, they have started to sort of go on the right route by saying, okay, we won't let the streaming tail wag the, the, WBD dog. I think Comcast has its broadband business and that's different. I look at Disney and I think strategically and in terms of some of the decisions they've made, they've really been pulled in several different directions. And I look at Paramount and I just think as an independent sort of entity, how does that actually sort of survive in the, uh, certainly in the streaming anyway, how does it survive over the longer term? Yeah, personally, I also think there's a, there's a question mark over here over Netflix. Yes, Netflix has done very well. It's making profits. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it's got a global presence. But quite frankly, when you look at his historical content, it doesn't really have that much. Which is why I made the point before about maybe Netflix looking at Paramount. And again, I go to this sort of total addressable market picture. If you look according to Cantor in the US, as for penetration is probably around 85, 86 percent. If you look at Europe, there are clear signs that right. it's even in the most markets, you know, it's flatlining around 65 percent in somewhere like the UK. Also as well, and this is the other thing that gets missed with these streaming models, it's not just about subscriber numbers, it's about the average revenue per user. And that is much lower outside the US. So again, you've got those dynamics as well. Ian, great stuff. Thanks Thanks for breaking it down for us. Ian Whitaker, Managing Director and Owner at Liberty Sky Advisors over in London, been covering the media industry for decades. He's got great perspective. Appreciate getting a few minutes of his time. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at PT Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.